Hello, listeners, and welcome to another episode of Subscription Scaled. I'm your host, Nick Frederick. With me today, our guest is Chris Ramanani, who is the co-founder and CEO of Fireflies.ai. Chris, welcome to the show. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me. Really excited to be here. Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. This is a new category and uh, you know, uh, a, a new product that's out there that people might not know much about. Uh, I'm certainly excited to dive in here. So why don't we go there? Tell us tell us about Fireflies. Yeah. So Fireflies is an AI meeting assistant and conversational intelligence platform. What that means is we have an AI assistant named Fred that follows you around on your meetings. So whether it's your Zoom calls, WebEx calls, Microsoft Teams, Google Meet, all the major video conferencing providers, it joins your meetings, it transcribes it, takes notes, summarizes it, lets you search back through your meetings, provides analytics and insights on top. Uh, our whole goal is to help you be productive and not have to take notes ever again and have perfect recall after every conversation. So you're saying I don't have to take notes of my conversations, type them up and send them out anymore. Is that, did I hear you correctly? That is correct. Where do I sign up? Because that is one of the most painful parts of my day, summarizing meetings, yeah. right? That's correct. Yeah. Well, what, what, uh, yeah, where'd you get the idea? Like, what, what, what was the impetus for the business? Yeah. So it goes back to, I think, my days working as a product manager at Microsoft. Uh, I worked across the collaboration suite, uh, across Office, got a chance to interact with different teams, including the Skype team. And, uh, Back then, I think that there wasn't any tools like these. Uh, but what I did notice from my own work experience in corporate right out of college is how many meetings you have, how many times you're trying to coordinate people, uh, get people in the room, and at least email, I can always search back through and I have a record of it. So I can at least remember if I didn't answer an email. But if I have five back-to-back -back meetings in a day, I'm not going to remember each one, no matter what, unless I take a pen and piece of paper. And even then, you feel that if you pain. have to have the same meetings over again because someone didn't show up or they were not there that day, uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time, right? A meeting with five people, like if you think about payroll and all that, like one hour meeting, it could be like a couple thousand dollars, right? So we thought meetings were inherently valuable, but more so than that, I thought conversations, there's so much rich insights around conversations. So it started with this vision of how do we unlock the knowledge buried inside conversations and we said, let's start with meetings and let's build a system of record for meetings. Uh, and then from there, we said, OK, how do we make meetings more actionable? And then we started diving into building the AI assistant. And then from there, we thought about how do we get someone to use this? So it has to be really integrated into their workflows. So Fireflies connects to your calendar. It'll know when you have a Zoom meeting. It'll join automatically, or if you manually invite Fred at Fireflies.ai. So it's like me having my own secretary that follows me around, a virtual secretary. And then it joins the meeting as a participant. It captures everything. I can search back through it. Uh, it'll also send out meeting recaps, like as emails, so I don't have to do. Uh, I can save things into Slack for me. Uh, if I'm on a sales call, I can have a conversation. It'll know who I spoke with and then go into the CRM under that record fill out the call notes and the call logs so I don't have to do post-meeting data entry as a salesperson. So yeah, everything we built is around this vision of uh, being really tied to a person's workflow and so that you don't have to go out of your way to do something else or use another tool or another widget. It's all integrated. So you started this in 2016, is that right? 2016 was uh, when I left Microsoft. I was supposed to go to grad school. Yeah. Uh, and then I flew out to Boston. My co-founder and CTO, Sam, uh, was graduating at MIT. We decided to get together and start working on uh, you know, different projects. We just used the same name, Fireflies, for it. In the or early days, we were consulting. We were bootstrapping. Uh, we were contracting out. We were building Chrome extensions. We were doing all sorts of things. Uh, but the actual version of Fireflies that you see today, we started working closer towards 2019 uh, and uh, we rolled it out in 2020. So there was a three year period where we were literally experimenting with everything out there in terms of machine learning, chatbots, natural language processing. Um, and so it, it was like, you know, walking through a desert and trying to find uh, something that was worth committing to and going really deep on. And so we fell in love with the voice space and uh, 2019, 2018, around that time, uh, we started working on the platform. 2020, right before the pandemic, uh, January of 2020, I remember we rolled out the 
version of Firefly that's out there today. And then we've obviously made several iterations on top. Um, and then the pandemic came, everyone started using video conferencing, Zoom, mm -hmm. Microsoft Teams. Um, so we rode that wave uh, and uh, it also made the technology come front and center over the last two years. Yeah, that is that is definitely where I was going with this is, you know, the timing of obviously, you know, AI had been had been taking off. But you guys married that with this concept of we're all going remote and we are now and we're going to continue to be for the foreseeable future. So interesting that you launched it one month before the pandemic uh, really took off here, uh, at least in the U.S. Um, so take take us through that a little bit like what was that like you know to then one month later your your product is now out in the wild you're getting people to start using it and now you've got all these people who are having to do remote meetings like what has that done for your growth tra trajectory yeah i definitely think the pandemic accelerated in the early days um we obviously didn't anticipate everything closing down and things going remote I will say, though, that we are strong believers in remote. We see other companies like Zapier, GitLab, who were remote from day one. And so even though we're based out here in San Francisco, uh, myself and my co-founder were remote from day one, um, you know, after the first year, like we were remote. And so we've built a remote company before even the pandemic. So from a company point of view, there wasn't much uh, operational change. But it was really interesting because when we built Fireflies, we thought with that remote first mindset because we ourselves were remote and we used to think, how would I want to use Fireflies in that context? And then when the pandemic came out uh, or you know, it ended up happening, unfortunately, it's never a good thing. But uh, what ended up happening was a lot of the big corporations, big companies were saying, hey, we have to do remote. Schools were going remote, online classes. And so the amount of time we were spending on video conferencing rapidly went up. And we had demo tested beta fireflies before the pandemic era, and people were still using it because you'd have a conference room, but you'd have a telecom setup, or you'd have like a few folks joining in remotely. And so fireflies could join as one of those remote participants in a conference room because they're all tied up to Zoom or your uh, conferencing setup. So we never thought of building it for the remote uh, use case exclusively. We just thought it'll be there in your conference room or in a remote setting. In terms of the early days and the growth, uh, keeping the lights on is definitely very difficult and scaling up. And it's a good problem to have. But it, there were many like nights where we're pulling uh, all-nighters because we want to keep the uh, system up and running. And we have a thing at Fireflies where I can be late to a meeting, but Fireflies has to show up on time every day. And that is a very high task, high bar when you're a small team. We were about 10 people around that time. Uh, and, uh, yeah, we, we've been, uh, able to grow that we haven't really spent any money on marketing or ads or any of that. It's been really organic word of mouth, people seeing it on meetings, people talking about it. Uh, and through that process, it spread to over, you know, several hundred thousand organizations where they're using fireflies, um, you know, millions of people every month that get meeting notes and summaries from fireflies. Um, it's been a journey. Uh, we take great inspiration from awesome products like Calendly, where you know you grow silently. You're not making a lot of noise, uh, but it's out there. People talk about it. People use it, and if the customers like it, that's all we could ask for. Yeah. Well, with that trajectory, how have you guys balanced like? You were talking about keeping the lights on, but you're like wanting to continue to grow the product, right? And in terms of its capabilities and make it a product that people ultimately love. And if you're really bootstrapping it and relying on word of mouth, it's got to be like a work great all the time kind of product, right? You're relying on that. So how have you, how have you kind of balanced those two things? Yeah, we were fortunate to raise our seed round in 2019. So uh, towards the end of 2019 was when we raised our seed round. Uh, we, we had decided at that time because of the market we're going after and the way we were going to a market, meaning we're a product led uh, initiative, meaning we want everyone to be able to use it and sign up and start experiencing the product. So we're not literally limiting anyone. Like there are some tools out there that are only exclusively for salespeople or only exclusively for call centers. For us, we wanted to democratize AI and we wanted Fireflies to be used by every person inside an organization. Every teammate can find value from Fireflies. And uh, when we had that mindset, we realized we have to build our system and architecture in a way so that everyone can use it. Um, so that did take time and energy. And that was one of the reasons why we said, how big can this go? And this addressable market is massive. Like when you think about every single 
knowledge worker out there, think about even just every Zoom user, every Google Meet user, uh, that's, that's massive. That's any person in the corporate workplace. And we had this vision of what we're building is like the Alexa or Siri, but for the corporate workplace uh, inside your meetings. And think mm -hmm. about how hard it is to build technology like Siri or Alexa. And, you know, we had to take that plus all the corporate uh, complexities on top. Mm -hmm. So we with that, we raised the money. Um, we you know we took the time to build the product. Uh, even then, there's always um, tech debt and scaling challenges that you face in the early days. But we were really glad we took our time during the beta to engineer our microservices and our product the right way so that otherwise I don't think we would have been able to handle the influx during the pandemic. Um, and right. yeah, that was like a big thing for us. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that that growth that quickly and the environment being <laughs> a perfect situation, you know, for your type of product, I mean, that could actually crush your business, right? You could you could lose focus on your product or, you know, get too focused on growing the subscriber base. Um, how have you stayed disciplined? Yeah, uh, too much of anything, even good things will eventually be bad. So you have to be uh, disciplined and definitely uh, moderate in your approach. Uh, right. So I think demand is great. But if you're not able to fulfill that demand and you keep making mistakes, that looks bad. Not that we haven't made mistakes. We've made many mistakes along the way. Uh, it's about learning from that feedback, uh, being very customer centric. Uh, I, to this day, I still read a lot of support tickets, a lot of feedback. Uh, anytime there's an issue, how do we think about improving it so that this ticket does not get asked again in the future by another person? So we're just mm -hmm. religiously focused on helping our customers uh, have the best experience. And because we're going for that larger market, larger scale, um, as a SaaS product, we had to think about everything from how we price the product to how people experience the product. Um, you know, there's exact solutions like Fireflies out there where people are charging uh, hundreds of dollars per seat per month, right? And you have to almost make like a 10K or 20K commitment upfront to use a platform like that. Meanwhile, they look at Fireflies and say, wow, I can get started for as little as $10, $15 per month as an individual. Um, and then there's also a free tier, which gives me free transcription credits and all of that. Um, and people ask us like, why are you essentially doing that? And for us, we want it so that any person, whether it's one person inside the org or a large department or the entire company, making that decision is easier for you. And we don't want to limit you in what you have access to, right? When you come to our website, everything is transparent from our pricing to the features, to the functionality, to what you can explore. And we have to do that because we have many different use cases. We're not just serving salespeople. We're serving people in recruiting, headhunters, uh, marketing. So there's so many people that are using the product. It's like when you look at the Calendly's of the world, the Slack's of the world, the Zoom's of the world. Uh, you can't say Fireflies is only for one. It's really meant for everyone, all knowledge workers. And so we built the product where we want you to experience it. We want you to get to that value. And then you realize you need more storage. You need more transcription. You want more advanced APIs or integrations uh, to different platforms, uh, more maybe feature functionality uh, like capabilities. Uh, there's value for uh, wanting to subscribe and pay. So that's like the sort of business we build. And I think that model has helped us because we have the virality of a consumer company uh, as well as the features functionality of like a B2B SaaS company. So we mix both. And I think we're going to see more of that in the future for other companies as well. Yeah. Was that your strategy from the very beginning to have these tiers and kind of give some, you know, give customers a taste that, so that they might move up? Or was that something you developed along the way? Yeah, it was from day one. That was our vision. In fact, yeah. we always got some counterproductive uh, feedback uh, from people uh, who would say, like, this is really valuable technology. It should be used in the contact center space. It should be an enterprise uh, sales led motion where you're going after these large, large companies. Um, and you had to sell big ticket deal sizes, then our process would have been a more sales oriented product. Nothing wrong with that. There's many successful companies that have been built around that. Uh, for us, we were going for volume. We're pricing for scale. If you look at like products like Atlassian, like Jira, uh, that's what they say is like, you know, pricing's on our website. Anyone can start using it. And then as you get value, you expand over time. Same with like really good products like Slack, Dropbox, all of these guys felt that motion. So 
we built that process that way where we don't really have a dedicated sales function per se. We have customer onboarding people who will help you along the way uh, if you need help. But today, theoretically, a thousand person company can come in and sign up and start using Fireflies without really any human intervention. Um, and along the way, if they need help with using an API or using an turning on an integration or want to like look at our like security docs, like we'll, we'll help them along the way. So we care about the small guys. We also want to support the big guys. So we've done a lot of the work, like even like getting SOC 2 type 2 compliance for enterprises. So security is a big thing. Um, like thinking about encryption, thinking about data access, thinking about admin controls, right? Like when you're one person versus you have a 20 person team and you want to control which meetings Firefly joins, giving people that control and that flexibility. So we, we think about it, but it's really like building 10 different products in one because you're uh, supporting so many different use cases. So, gosh, there's so many different directions we could go right now. Um, but one thing you said there that it certainly went to the top of my mind was, you know, you're transcribing what we're saying in conversations, right? Um, so there's the concerns around privacy. Uh, there are cons concerns around, you know, like trade secrets. There's concerns around PCI and, you know, ever saying payment information or, you, you know, that sort of thing in a, in a conversation. How have you guys, number one, been able to just stay on top of that, but how have you dealt with it? Yeah. For us, uh, we took the bot approach where the bot physically joins your meetings as the approach because then it's more transparent. Because people today record calls and stuff using other right. pieces of software and never inform. Whereas if the mm. bot is on the call, you know, people are naturally going to ask, hey, what is this? this? I see Firefly's AI note taker on this call. And that leads to a natural conversation. In fact, a lot of our customers are excited to tell them, hey, I'm trying this new uh, software out. Uh, it's an AI note taker. And they're like, wow, that's really cool. Let me go sign up and start using Check it. it. Out. So we've turned yeah. compliance into a word of mouth viral uh, aspect, right? It's it's baked into the culture. And uh, yes, in the early days, like people might be like, hey, I don't want the bot on. So they'll remove it from the meeting. Uh, but I think people have realized, at least teams, right, that the value you gain from having that information, having that knowledge is so much more valuable. So if I've had a meeting let's say with you six months ago, and we're syncing up about talking about a new topic. And then Firefly is able to help me jog my memory by saying, hey, here's what are the, some of the key things you guys talked about. It's making my relationships better. So if I'm a salesperson, yeah. if I'm in a customer facing role, if I'm in investor relations, I want to be on top of my game. And so people realize the value of capturing transcribing um, is far more beneficial. And similarly for the participants, them having like the meeting recaps and the transcripts uh, and to be able to search back through that. So if they agreed on something like I, we have so many like uh, consulting firms, uh, agencies that use Fireflies where, you know, when they're discussing contracts or when they're discussing like a uh, statement of work and what to do, it's very easy for them to avoid conflict and converse uh, and, you know, debate afterwards because they're like, sure. hey, we talked about this. Are you sure about this? And then, you know, you can follow up after yeah. with, with that. So, yeah, I think it's a natural process. And then we want to give people more flexibility as well. Like, you know, if you want to kick out the bot, you can at any time. You can stop at any point in time. If you delete the recording or asset from Fireflies, it's wiped forever, right? So we it's all about access control like uh, and what you have as the end customer. Uh, but I think in general, as an industry, uh, we're moving towards it being more socially acceptable to have your meetings transcribed and uh, having an, a virtual note taker. Once you get into enterprises, though, and, you know, well, maybe you've got a couple people who started using it and then it spread throughout the organization. And now all of a sudden you've gotten the CISO coming at you going, wait a minute, what are you doing here? How are you storing my data? Like you said you want to be focused on individual users and then, you know, hopefully it spreads. But when you start going up into larger organizations, especially enterprises, how are you now dealing with, you know, yeah them coming at you with these sort of requests? It's turning into actually a very fruitful conversation with them because we're on top of our game. We have our security docs, we have our compliance, like uh, all of our privacy information. And a lot of times it turns into a very good conversation because this is the same thing that happened with Slack, right? At least with Fireflies, you're having conversations in Slack, you're actually saving, sharing files, like confidential files and stuff that's stored on the cloud, right? So imagine the same friction that Slack would have had, Dropbox would have had, um, even, uh, you know, firms like, uh, 
Yammer back in the day. So for us, we want to work with the larger firms and the departments, and we do have some of larger customers where the conversation turns into, hey, my teammates are using this. I'm curious what this is. But first, can you also send us like what your security and data retention policies are, uh, how you guys manage this stuff, and uh, that you're not like, you know, selling this data or anything like that. So we we provide all of that information. Um, you know, it's not easy to get SOC 2 type 2 compliance because you have to go through months, 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 almost for a year to get that sort of approval. Um, there's several companies that still sell to enterprise that don't have that today. Uh, we're also thinking about HIPAA, like how do we like, because we get so many healthcare requests and we don't support healthcare customers actively today. But like, you know, I can see how valuable fireflies would be in the healthcare industry, right? For doctors talking to patients and want to take notes. And so HIPAA compliance is something we think about. So there are many, many different avenues. I think one is as you mature as a company and as you build that discipline around how you help people, how you enable people. And if the admin says, look, I don't want this, uh, you know, being used in meetings, sure, we'll turn it off. But a lot of times it's more like, how can I have control over which meetings Firefly joins, um, you know, which teammates I can invite. And so as an admin, when you can take over that workspace uh, with Fireflies, you really will have the, all those controls and stuff. So we, we want the end users to be happy. We wanted them to share it and spread it and then get their teammates to start using it. And then from there, we want to make sure that the admin has the guardrails and safeguards in place uh, where they need to, right? So it's working up uh, the value chain versus uh, building really crappy software, telling, you know, selling it top down with a heavy sales force, and then uh, forcing people to use something that they might not want to use, right? So we want to go up the food sure. chain. It's much harder to do that, it takes much longer um, versus doing the top down model. Well, uh, as you guys have gone through this growth uh, and built out your systems, what are some of the key metrics that you guys are paying attention to that you consider the most important right now? Is it bringing in from the top? Is it trying to reduce the churn at the bottom? Where, where are you guys focused? Yeah, we definitely think about the value as in the meetings that people are having because that is the growth engine ultimately. So the more meetings people are having with Fireflies, the more people are having Fireflies take notes. The more people that see it, the more people that get to enjoy the benefits that Fireflies has to offer. So that's really our starting point. And uh, we we work from there. Like, that's really the thing. So if more people can experience Fireflies and get to that aha moment faster, right, activation. And then from there, once you're starting to use Fireflies consistently, it becomes a daily use product almost for really power users or at least a weekly uh, use product, right? For people that want to bring it to specific types of meetings like webinars or like uh, lectures or like uh, any of these sort of discussions. So uh, it, it really is something where, uh, you know, we start with that value and then we look at how do we provide value on top, right? It's great. We can now reliably capture your meetings, transcribe them, make them searchable, build you a knowledge base or a system of record for all your conversations. Now, how do we provide value to your team, right? So now you have hundreds of your team's meetings and how can we pull up the knowledge, surface up the knowledge, surface up important information? Uh, how can we help you get more out of your workflows, right? Like so that you can save time on CRM data entry or saving, sending messages to Slack. Like how can Fireflies do all that for you? And yeah, there's just so much potential there. We're still working on it. We're still tapping into it. We have a series of big uh, announcements that we're coming up with um, on this. Like how do you provide value to people on top of the AI note taker, right? And so that really is the next uh, step of the journey for Fireflies. And uh, we're, we're excited about that because as you provide more value to people, it become, it goes from, wow, this is a nice handy tool to, holy crap, I need to use it. It's a must have for me. Like I have had customers come to me and says, uh, and said like, oh, if I'm on a meeting and then uh, I forget to invite Fireflies or I don't have it, uh, I feel like on edge because like I'm just so used to relying on someone else to take notes and like you you know when there's like lulls during the meeting where I'm not really paying attention in the back of my mind I'm thinking okay I can go back to fireflies at any time and review it and I'll be good um right. or if some people are not attending some meetings like with their teammates they'll ask their teammates and then go ahead and send fireflies into those meetings and then review them afterwards um, so because of that in my own org, I have a lot less redundant meetings, uh, because I know that I can just go and review the Firefly sync instead of bothering some of my teammates. 
Uh, but yeah, I think to answer your question, we look at the value that we provide to the end users, the activation, the meeting volume, how often they're using it, uh, what integrations they're using. We want them to have a great experience. And then from there, we want their team to have a great experience, right? And then from there, we build up towards how do we get the organization to have uh, get value out of this? Yeah, I can totally see that. And I can see how there would be the mental crutch there of, hey, I know this is going to be recording what we're doing here, summarizing it, and I can rely on it later. So yeah, I, I mean, it's got it's got my head turning. It, it sounds a lot like crack, like people get real addicted to it quickly, and then all of a sudden they can't live without it, right? Uh, I, I It's a very interesting responsibility for us uh, where we it this is one of the reasons why our SLAs have to be so good, meaning our requirements to keep it up all the time. If you think about Fireflies today, like it'll be joining all the meetings on EST, PST, US time zones. And by the, by the time that kind of slows down around 5 p.m., we can't sit back and relax because now the next wave uh, in other countries, like the meetings, their morning meetings are starting. Yeah. And then by midnight, like meetings in India, people are using it in. So it's a 24 7 endeavor. And uh, we had to build that 24 7 engineering culture, support culture, uh, ops culture from day one. And we have people across more than 10 different time zones to help with this process. Uh, so that's not easy. It's a lot of sleepless nights. Uh, but that's also where you have to be very uh, religious and dedicated to the craft, uh, which which takes time. Uh, but yeah, to, to that point, with great power comes great responsibility because people love using it and want to keep using it. Um, we can't let them down. And so we constantly strive to keep making the product better and more reliable for them. That's great to hear. I mean, it would be it'd be awfully easy to kind of rest on your laurels there and and knowing that, hey, they they now they can't live without it. So where are they going to go or what are they going to do? Right. But, you know, constantly focusing on that customer, how they're using your product, how they're relying on your product, that that that's key to growth. Right. Yeah. I will say if anyone's in the audience wants to build a SaaS product, it's much, much easier to go build a product that has a few forms or fields and you input some things and it shows you like some graphs or BI uh, related stuff. But like when you are working on voice over IP, real time streaming, like these sort of things like transcription, uh, it's super, super cumbersome. And uh, the technical complexity uh, is very high. I think that in itself creates a moat for people. Um, but think about it this way, right? If you look at YouTube's, the Twitches of the world, even Zooms of the world, it takes a level of pedigree for those sort of companies to have that sort of architecture and scale, right? And we're not even at, you know, anywhere there, but like, if you look at the trajectory, imagine having fireflies in a million simultaneous conversations, right? Like, what does that look like? Uh, mm -hmm. Just the past year, right? Like if, if fireflies was a human, it's doing almost more than a hundred years of meetings every week, right? Or way more than that. And that's just like, you have to put that into perspective. Like how, how do you spin up and scale up? Uh, your system to do that. So always, always think of like, I think if you are, you know, bootstrapping or building a small team, are you picking a problem that you can, you know, you know, bite the apple, right? Or is it too big to chew on? So like, it's really important to figure that out. Um, and also the cost implications, right? Because what we build like infrastructure costs are very high uh, when you do VoIP and you have to think about that and how that bakes into your pricing system and how do you think about economies of scale and how do you lower your costs over time? So there's many, many, like, I think it's a layered problem. And I, I will say, I, I see some of my friends that are in other businesses where it's just like much simpler to build and maintain because they're building, you know, typical web to websites uh, with forms and fields, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a good kind of segue there because you guys had to invest so much and focus so much on the product and how to build out the infrastructure to make it work and make it work well. There's all the other tools and processes that sit around just running a business, right? Being able to bill people or your customer CRM, you know, all of those sorts of things. Where did you guys draw the line between the sorts of things where you said, this is core to the product, we're going to focus on building this versus I'm going to go buy that off the shelf? Yeah. So definitely, uh, you know, using payment processors like Stripe, it, it's a no brainer to use in some solution that's already out there off the shelf, pull it, use their APIs uh, for payment processing. Like people don't want to reinvent the wheel there. Uh, people don't want to reinvent the wheel on, uh, you know, using AWS or GCP or some of these cloud providers. Like it's, it's important to uh, take something out of the box. Yes, it'll be more expensive in the early days, 
But if you want to get going, a lot of times it's about taking the building box off the shelf. And then over time, as you get uh, validation from customers to improve and uh, maybe replace some of those things with your own stuff. But in the early days, yeah, there, we have to look at everything core to our business uh, like that is customer impacting. And then there's other areas, right? Like we use like CRMs, like we use HubSpot CRM. Uh, we use like video conferencing tools. Uh, we also look at the the systems that we have to have in place, right? Like we've had to spend a lot of time building our own data analytics engine and like warehousing and all of that stuff. Like we use tools like Segment, which is great, but we have to draw unique insights that maybe like an off the shelf dashboard will not be able to show us. So we've had to invest in like a data pipeline. So there's a lot of stuff that happens on the infrastructure level, on the data ops lo- level, that's not even customer impacting, but because of the scale we're at, we have to do it ourselves. And that requires engineering time and energy and investment. Um, but it also depends on how many people you're serving. Like if your total customer base is only going to be a few thousand people or only like a thousand customers, right? Cause you're selling a high ticket product. Uh, you don't have to worry about building out some of those other aspects, right? Of like trying to scale, trying to do like real time volume simultaneously, um, trying to do this whole data architecture piece. Like you can relatively bootstrap or build something, um, you know, that is going to generate, you know, positive revenue streams without having to deal with the engineering complexity. So it all comes back to time, money, and complexity. So. It's kind of the age old, you got to weigh those three three things out, right? And decide what you can handle. When it comes to like the product itself and the features you're going to add in, the functionality, what the sort of things that maybe customers are asking for, how do you weigh out? Well, how do you gather all of that? And then how do you weigh it out and determine your product roadmap? Like what's that process look like for you guys? Yeah, that's a great question. So we have feature requests coming in all the time. And I've, to this day, read every single feature request that came from a customer that got filed in our system. Um, Our CS team, credit to them for really being open to what customers are saying. And then we document it. We start like tallying up, like who's asking for what consistently. And then we have engineering discussions at the beginning of each sprint or quarter. And uh, we try to prioritize things according to that based on complexity, need, demand, We also even have, I send out our PM team, our product managers to go and talk to customers directly. And uh, when we're going into beta, we try to give it to a few folks to actually use and get qualitative feedback. We do A-B testing. We roll out to a handful of customers and see how the response is and then iterate. Um, Sometimes it's also important to kill features that may not be adding value, but you're having to spend a lot of time and energy supporting. Um, So for us, The beauty of the bottoms up freemium uh, system is we have enough people to be sounding boards for us and constantly giving feedback. We'll take feedback just as positively from a free user as much as like an enterprise business user. So we will gather all that feedback, we will put them in cohorts and we will prioritize and build uh, based on what uh, folks want. Like today in Fireflies, we have 40 plus integrations to different apps and CRMs and all these other places. And that happened as a result of understanding users' needs and prioritizing our integration roadmap. And that's just one example of, of, of what, how we do it. Yeah, that makes sense. How, how are you dealing with the customers that want features but aren't higher up on your priority list? How do you keep them happy enough, I guess? Yeah, I, I think that we it's always a challenge of quality over quantity. So if we're going to build something, we want to roll it out right. Like we can... Uh, put something together in haste and then throw it against the wall and see what what happens and sticks. Uh, But we're in a level where the bar is much higher and the expectations are much higher. When your core product is at this level, anything new you add has to be up. It can't be below. So we try to get people to, you know, understand that. But ultimately, we also build our platform very modularly. So if there's someone that wants to do a custom analysis on top, We have our API, they can go use it and then they can customize things the way they want, um, which is very, very, very cool. Um, So we give people flexibility. We have so many turnkey integrations. You want to go build your own integration? Sure. You can do that uh, with Fireflies. You want to use Zapier to do a custom workflow around it? You can do that. We have a Zapier integration. So uh, if there's something that we don't natively provide, we provide other avenues for them to use it. And uh, based on that, we can learn. And if they uh, you know, are having success with those APIs and Zapier integrations and workflows, 
that's further incentive for us to say, hey, let's go productize this rather than just make it an integration. Yeah. There's nothing better than having someone else build a <laughs> feature or an integration for your platform, right? No. How have you guys, like I, I, we talked before about you've got the the freemium model, start up with a free tier, be able to take them up to, uh, uh, to, to different levels. Have you guys been playing with what's in each of those tiers? I, I mean, I, I realize you have the tier structure, but, you know, are you looking at a certain percentage that you expect to be in every bucket and how have you adjusted? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very interesting for us uh, where we've actually leaned on the side of giving more value in the, the free tier over time. So giving more storage or giving more, uh, you know, we, we've experimented with a lot of different things. So, for example, like in our pro tier today, in the past, as a team, you'd only get 8,000 minutes of storage. Now you get 8,000 minutes of storage per user. That's like that amplifies our value uh, per team because we want to more teams to use Firefly. So we felt like we shouldn't limit it to a total number, but it should be per user, right? So let's incentivize people to be part of teams. So that's some that's a new change that's come out recently. Um, on the free tier, we have things where you, you get an X number of free credits when you sign up. If you're a business domain, you get more credits. Um, and uh, if you invite your teammates, you also can get more transcription credits. So there's an, again, incentive for teams, for people to get more credits uh, if they are part of the, the platform, right? So we try to incentivize the right behavior. Our goal is not to just have you pull your credit card out up front. We know that if you use Fireflies enough, you will definitely find value over time, right? Whether that's in a week, two weeks, uh, a month. Um, so we're playing the long game. And ultimately, we want people to find value, use it, bring their teammates in, share it, um, and then from there, grow. And yeah, we definitely we definitely add, do, do that. And I think there's a lot more differentiation now between the tiers as well. Like our business tier is going to have a whole set of robust features and insights and things like that that are not accessible on the other tiers. And so there's also value on top that you are, uh, you know, for the reason you are upgrading. It's not just like, oh, I get more storage or transcription. Uh, it's because, oh, there's this amazing functionality that I would not get on the other tier. So that's how we think about pricing and structuring. Um, but it's a journey, right? For a lot of people, they'll start off free. The free could be like they're, you know, within the first seven to 14 days, uh, they know what they like, what they don't like, and then they just expand from that. When it comes to, like you were talking before about there's customers all over the world, right? They're constantly in different countries coming on different times of the day and using it. How are you guys dealing with being able to offer the product in those local areas, maybe local currencies? Are you able to cover the, the big ones or what challenges, I guess, are you guys seeing as you look to go more uh, international? Yeah. So pricing is definitely USD uh, today and across like the, the different uh, areas. For us, we support English transcription uh, for our platform. So one of the national requests is how do you, uh, how like, can you provide Spanish? Can you provide French? Can you provide Hindi, like in India? And so that's will probably be our next area like when we think about global markets um, and how can we offer more languages so that there's a direct product component to it there's a direct investment there but uh that's something that we can definitely like i think consider fireflies is used in over 100 plus countries today and uh many people will use it right like because a lot of them like the professional language at used at work is english so we tend to be able to be used in many many different uh places so we constantly think about uh, this, like this thing is like, could we have even further adoption, right? In some of these companies like Latin America, in Europe, uh, if we started offering some of these other languages. And I think that's, yeah, that's like a no brainer. It's just like a matter of time uh, for us to, to get there and do it. Have you looked at in-country, well, obviously in-country currencies or in-country payment methods, or are you guys sticking with U.S. dollars right now? We are sticking with U.S. dollars, but we know that uh, different countries are making different changes, right? And so we're fortunate to be able to use Stripe for a lot of the payment processing. But I think we could, with Stripe, like, you know, look into maybe looking at different currencies or showing it in different currencies. Uh, and again, different countries have different regulations, right, in terms of how uh, charges work and all of those stuff. Like, we notice like certain credit cards like in India may not be uh, uh, accepted by Stripe, right? When they do the payment processing. So uh, it is, there is definitely a work when, when you are building for global, we built for global day one, but uh, there are different things you have to do. Like specifically, since we're on the topic of subscriptions and uh, currency and payments, 
Uh, we do know that like in some countries, there's a higher rate of failure for credit cards than other countries. And how do you handle that as a, and what, what workflows do you build in? Uh, so there's definitely challenges to that too, that you have to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Chris, this has been fascinating to learn about this business and congratulations on all the, uh, all the growth. Um, if any of the listeners today want to find out more or maybe ask you a question and learn more about, uh, Fireflies, where can they go? Yeah. So fireflies.ai is where you can go um, for folks that want to try it out. It's free to start, uh, get started in using and experiencing it. Uh, and then if they want to reach out to us, you can reach out directly uh, to support at fireflies.ai for any sort of things like partnerships, collaborations, all of that. Um, and then I'm also on LinkedIn. So Chris Romanini. Uh, so there's, yeah, those are like the places uh, for, for people to get in touch with us. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, I'll definitely be checking it out myself. Uh, you know, just the peace of mind of having uh, record some of the meetings that I have and not having to have follow up ones to repeat ourselves all, all over again is very attractive. So uh, I think you got a great product and uh, wishing you guys the best of luck. Yeah, thanks so much, Nick. I had a lot of fun talking about some of the things that are near and dear to me. So uh, yeah, I love talking absolutely. about SaaS any day. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Chris. Oh,